you can find a co-founder or a number of co-founders who really complement each other, you have skills that are different from each other, experiences and domain knowledge different from each other, and who you really respect and like and want to work together, have fun together, that's a much better model. I thought I'd just share a few more maybe unusual ideas that, um, that have struck me or helped me uh, over, the, over the years. Um, some people ask me, should I start a business by myself or have a co-founder? And I'm personally a great fan of co-founders. I think it's very hard for one person to kind of uh, do everything in a startup. And if you can find a co-founder or a number of co-founders who really complement each other, you have skills that are different from each other, experiences and domain knowledge different from each other, and who you really respect and like and want to work together, have fun together, that's a much better model. Um, but I would also say, make sure you have a written shareholders agreement. Um, things are always rosy at that idea stage, and it's much better to write down that share, write down that understanding of how you'll work together. And I also am not a fan of 50-50 uh, startups. I think it's better to ultimately agree on who is the final decision maker, and um, hopefully you're never going to get to pulling out the shareholders agreement and reading through it, but. If you do, it's much better to have one that's strong and helps uh, people understand how to move on. Um, fun is something I think is a natural state for a healthy work environment. Um, I don't think it's a core value. I think it's more like a, 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 a symptom of things going right. So it's also when it isn't fun, when you detect that things are not fun at, within a team or in a company, um, to me, that's a signal you've got to take really seriously and immediately and try to figure out what the problem is. So it's a simple, fun word, fun, but uh, if you're not having it or your team's not having it, figure out what that is, dig down. Sometimes the solutions aren't so easy. Often they involve some of those difficult conversations, but it's much better to, rot that, uh, to, to find that out earlier and deal with it earlier than let things uh, remain unfun for too long. Financing is a topic that um, is one of those business topics that I do think you need to know something about if you're doing a startup. <clears throat> um, and from what I've seen, a lot of startups spend a lot of time struggling with financing. Um, and um, some of it may be wasted time. Like, as a bit of a mathy, I, I kind of envision that there's a sort of a perfect, optimal financing model for every business plan or every business idea at any point in time. And you should have some pretty good idea what that model is for your business plan and your idea uh, before you go waste a whole lot of time trying to finance the wrong business model with the wrong plan. Um, you know, whether it's common shares or preferred shares or different kinds of preferred uh, clauses or it's, you know, debt of the various kinds or it's self-financed, um, whatever it is, you should have, there, there is kind of an optimal set of those that fits particular plan. Um, and so be realistic. If, you, if your you know, financing plan really requires you to go and raise millions of dollars of equity and you have no track record and no rich you know, uncle, then you know, you're probably not going to do it. So figure out a different business plan or, or go and try to find the money f that you can raise and find a, or figure out what kind of money you can raise and then find a business model that fits that. Uh, capability. When my co-founder and I started our software company, we had no track record. We didn't have any rich uncles, <laughs> so we um, we had no choice but to self-finance, and um, that worked out for us. We were able to start off, do consulting, get some money coming in from consulting, slowly build out a product that was going to be very low cost to sell and support, and then slowly evolve into becoming a software company over many years. On the other hand, with, with Bullfrog Power, you know, self-financing would have never worked. Bullfrog was an idea that needed millions of dollars in equity financing in order to get started, to have the critical mass, to become a brand that people would recognize, which um, eventually happened. And, and it, took fi it was financed for six or seven years before it became uh, cash flow positive. Um, another idea I want to share with you is that um, Ideas are cheap and implementations are expensive. Um, I, I, 
I run across a lot of entrepreneurs who think they've got a great idea, and I should sign an NDA to hear about it. <laughs> and um, I just think it's kind of um, a, a little silly. You know, idea, anybody can have an idea. Ideas are really, um, there's thousands of them. I would say back in 2000, and when did uh, Tesla start? In 2005? Um, 2003. You know, there was probably 10,000 people in North America in 2003 that had the idea for an electric vehicle company. You know, it wasn't a unique idea. Um, Tesla is valuable today because of a great implementation of that idea. So I, I, I sometimes find entrepreneurs are just so caught up on the idea, they think it's so great, it's so unique. It may be great and unique, but don't be afraid to share it. And realize that it's not going to become valuable until it becomes a great implementation of that idea. So don't get too hung up on valuations early on. It's so much more important to get some money in quickly, start growing it, start proving out that it is a great idea, start becoming a valuable implementation, than getting hung up on uh, what you know the va your initial valuation is. Um, similarly, Uber, 2009. Lots of people had the idea that you could order, you know, kind of get cars to come around, pick people up, and charge it through a smartphone. It's not a, it's not a unique idea, it's a, but it's a brilliant implementation. Um, and another financing topic that I've seen um, kind of go wrong a few times is uh, the asymmetry between what entrepreneurs think about and know about financing terms and VC terms and what VCs know about financing in VC terms, present company accepted. The, um, the, if you don't know what a you know, two times participating liquidity preference means, like really means, um, you, know, you probably shouldn't be negotiating in terms of the VC. Uh, they know what that means. They know how valuable it is to them and how much more the company and the exit they're gonna have in anything but the very best scenarios. So make sure you understand those terms or somebody in your team really understands those terms if you're gonna get into uh, VC financing. I'm personally not a big fan of preferred terms. I think as an entrepreneur, I'd much rather be financed by somebody who's gonna buy common shares, the same as what I have and what my employees have, um, than get into preferred shares. Having said that, lots of deals wouldn't get done without using a preferred share structure. So. Um, just be careful about uh, what you get into. So I'm going to finish with um, a bit of a funny story about using professionals. At least it was funny to me at the time. <laughs> and then open it up to questions. So you know, people say, should I use you know, a low-cost accountant or an expensive accountant or lawyers or whatever? I'm personally a fan of using the best professionals you can, um, and you, that you can afford. I, in, in our software company, I think we avoided a potentially very bad IP dispute with another company simply because we went out and hired a top IP law firm in Silicon Valley. And as soon as we did that, the other side basically just um, gave up and negotiated with us because uh, they realized that we were serious. But sometimes you need to uh, stay in control and not trust the professionals. And my example for that is um, a time in our software company's history where you know, we were, it was about 1997, 98, Microsoft Windows had just come out. We had created a product for the Windows market, uh, which was just taking off. And we were very excited because Windows was going to be huge and we were going to have, you know, 10 times as many customers in Windows as we were going to have as we had in Unix workstations. And we thought, we need, we need a real name for our product line that's going to catch on with Windows programmers. Normally, we name everything ourselves. Let's go and get a professional. So we went down to Silicon Valley and hired like a top PR naming company. We told them that we needed a name that was going to exude Windows expertise. That's what we wanted our customers to think when they heard this new name. Signed a contract. They were going to get a lot of money for coming up with the name. Gave them a couple months to do it. And then we, and we needed the name at that point. Um, so we're down in, in San Francisco for a trade show. It's, we, we popped by their Silicon Valley office to hear what the new name was be. They you know, brought it, ushered us into this beautiful room. I think they even gave us wine and um, sat down. And the big unveiling was going to happen. And here it is for your, for your new product name. It's going to be Fenstermeister. 
which is German for Windows Master. So um, it's a brilliant name. <laughs> so uh, we um, decided that we knew more than the experts at that point. We were not going to go with Fenstermeister. We asked, what's your list of all your rejected names? Give that to us. And our team went to the bar that night, went through the list, picked a much better name. And um, then I started negotiating for a reduction in the cost of that contract.